What's up, people? I'm Shaggy, the Opinionated Hippie, and today we're going down a Jeff Beck rabbit hole. Um, yes, I'm doing this because Jeff Beck recently passed away about two weeks ago. Um, but the reason I'm doing this is not to sort of exploit his death and get three more uh, watches or anything. Um, but because Jeff Beck is an artist that I've never, ever, ever like dove down a rabbit hole for. Um, when he passed away, I read like the eulogies. I, I saw the list that different music publications published as far as like his best albums or the must hear Jeff Beck stuff. Um, and it is just, it is a musician that I've never gotten into. I own four of his albums. I thought I had only heard five. Turns out I have heard uh, six. Um, I know his Yardbird stuff, um, mainly because of my interest in Clapton. I know all the Yardbird stuff. Um, I know a lot of his side work that he's done with other musicians. Obviously, his Roger Waters stuff. He recently got a mention on my Roger Waters video. Um, but I only knew four albums. And of those four albums, one I probably listened to a handful of times when I bought it in the mid-80s and never visited again. It will be the first one I talked to about on this list, last on the list. Um, I have two others, which I, depending on my mood, I revisit every so often that I understand why people love them, but they kind of don't resonate with me. And then there's one that I genuinely love that I probably, that I definitely listen to way more than the other three. Um, the fifth one that I've heard, I checked out because two of the members on that album are in another band that I absolutely love. Um, video coming probably in like a week or so about that band. And then I didn't realize I had heard the sixth one until I heard it recently. Um, and I was like, oh, I know this album. I think I thought it was a Faces album or a Small Faces or one of those Rod Stewart bands. So anyways, it's a Rod Stewart album, obviously. Um, a Rod Stewart singing Jeff Beck album. Um, but anyways, so I knew six of them. I decided I was going to go back and re-listen to all of them. I did. I was able to almost immediately track down all of them uh, at our local library, which has an incredible Jeff Beck collection. Um, the friends who had had their uh, his albums either on vinyl or on CD. Um, and then two I had to listen to on streaming because I couldn't find them otherwise. But I've heard all of them at least twice. Some of them more than that. I've listened to pretty much a, a couple albums a day for the past couple weeks. And so I have opinions. Um, so if you are a hardcore Jeff Beck fan, I am still not. Um, Highly respect him as a guitar playing. Um, I think my overall sort of view of Jeff Beck, the reason why I think he's, I think he tends to be overlooked as far as the all-time great guitarist conversation goes. And I think that is going back and listening to these albums is he doesn't have that one album that if you remove the Jeff Beck guitar playing from is an album that stands up as one of those all-time greats. Clapton will forever have Layla and other assorted love songs. Regardless of what you think about Clapton, I know there's a lot of hate out there. Um, I know there's a lot of people who think he's he's overrated, which considering how much hate there is and how much people say he is overrated, I don't think he's no any longer overrated. But Clapton has Wheels on Fire. Clapton has Layla and other assorted love songs. Clapton even has a couple of his solo albums, which I think, regardless of the guitar playing, are such good albums that like it highlights his guitar playing. Fripp has a couple albums. Steve Howe has albums that are excellent. Um, Garcia, Zappa, all of these, Blackmore, all of these iconic guitar players have these albums which are like, ah, oh, holy grails of like rock or whatever genre they're in. I don't think Beck has that. And the one album I kept reading about was like, oh, this is the album, this is the one. Yeah, it's it's gonna be in the middle of this list. So it, it didn't resonate with me the way I think it's resonated with other people. So Jeff Beck is an absolutely incredible guitar player. Um, part of the problem I think also with Jeff Beck is part of his guitar style is he's relentlessly experimental. Like he, I imagine that his pedal board is sort of the guitar equivalent of Neil Peart's drum kit. Like he's got everything and he can make any noise and any sound and do anything he wants with it. He can be aggressive and hard. He can be jazzy and fluid. He can be soft and delicate. He's kind of all over the map. And while that's not a problem, I admire him for it. It makes, it saves many of these albums. It ultimately, he has a style like, if you play me a Clapton solo, I'm gonna guess it's Clapton. You play me a Santana solo, I know it's Santana. Zappa, Blackmore, Garcia, Fripp, even someone like Howe, Gilmore, 
I can recognize their guitar playing almost instantly. I still, after this, yes, it's only been a couple weeks of intense Jeff Beck listening. He is such a chameleon in the sense that he can do so many things and attack in so many ways that I also think he loses some of like his identity in it. I don't know, but that's my opinion. That's just how, that's just what I think in this experience. So come at this with lots of salt because again, uh, there's 15 albums. I'm not doing his collaboration albums the where he covered all the... Um, uh, the country songs. I think that's what it was. He did like an instrumental for a TV show. I'm not going anywhere near that one he did with Johnny Depp. Like, sorry, Johnny Depp fans ain't touching that one ever. Not doing his live ones. I am going to do one he did with a uh, Bogart in a piece because, um, well, I'll get to that when I get to it. But so there's 15 albums total. Um, you know, 11 of them. No, nine of them I'm only hearing for the first time the last two weeks. So take all this with a grain of salt. My opinion changes over the next six months. I might make another video and update this and see if I have changed my, my attitude about this. Um, how do we get through Jeff Beck from Frank Zappa? Oh, there's lots of ways. Punky's Whips, uh, Magic Fingers, Titties and Beer. He gets mentioned in those songs at least. Um, uh, he played on GTO's Permanent Damage. Uh, Frank Zappa in interviews was very complimentary of his uh, guitar playing. Specifically, I think he complimented Blow by Blow or Wired, one of those uh, sort of mid-70s jazz fusion uh, albums. So uh, Frank had a very high opinion of him. And uh, plus, Basio played with him. Kaliuta played with him. Um, there are probably lots of lots and lots of connections. But anyways, that's a lot of rambling. I'm probably not going to have a lot to say on these albums, probably other than just my basic opinion at this point. But I'm going to give it anyways, because this has been fun and I like doing this kind of thing. Obviously, when I'm done, let me know where I'm wrong. Let me know your rankings. I'm really more so than any other artist really interested in what other people have to say, because this is like a brand new world for me. It's a brand new rabbit hole. And I was genuinely surprised Um I assumed, as with someone like Clapton, who I love his 70s stuff, I could care less for anything after like 81, 83, I think was my last favorite Clapton album. I was surprised by how much I love Beck's late period stuff. I love his late period stuff. So that was a really pleasant surprise. So yeah, anyways, that's enough. I think I've said enough about Beck. If I forget to say something, I'll, I'll add it on later in the video. But let's get on to my least favorite, the only one that I actually don't think is any good. The only one I know I will never revisit again. Let's get on to number 15. Number 15 is his 1985 album, Flash. This was his, it was his fifth studio album solo, but that's weird because I'm also counting the Jeff Beck group stuff in this. So anyways, it came out in 85. Um, I bought it because there's a cover of People Get Ready in which Rod Stewart sings. One thing I realized going back and revisiting these, Rod Stewart has an absolutely amazing voice. Rod Stewart makes mediocre albums good. He makes good albums great. He wasn't able to save this album because he's only on one song. And in that song, the 80s drum sound just... I got to the point, it's the fourth song on this album. The first three songs were just almost unbearable to me because the 80s synth sound and everything that is 80s about this kind of just hurts my soul. Um, like I don't want to in any way belittle PTSD. That's a real thing. I know it. I've written plays, won awards about, uh, soldiers who have gone, gone through war. Um, like I, I, I know about this. My dad was in the Vietnam war. I understand PTSD, not in any way trying to mock it, but man, the sound on this just makes me upset. I do not like it. I bought it in 85, tried to listen to it. Even then, it was way too much for me um, as a 15-year-old. But anyways, yeah, it's rough. Uh, like Rod Stewart's voice on this is like, ah, oh, Savior, take us away from here. Save us. Take us somewhere else. But yeah, it, this was a rough listen. I just can't do it. What is the, the two good things about this? Jeff, Speck, Jeff Beck's guitar, which again, a little too 80s processed, a little too like lost in the music and the process music and Rod Stewart's voice. But yeah, I, I can't in any way. I will never listen to this album again. Um, I put it on the first time thinking, ah, okay, I bought this one, it's not that bad. Ugh. I revisited it again. It was the last album I revisited before making this video. Ugh. No, I can't do it. I can't do it. Uh, it's just, it's impossible. It just sounds way too 80s. Yeah, it's my number 15, Flash.
Number 14 is 1989's Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop. Um, this was the album that came out after Flash. It's still in the 80s. There's still pretty much an 80s hangover going on here. Basio sounds stiff like a drum machine. Oh, Basio's the drummer. Uh, Tony Hymas is on keyboards and synths. Again, it sounds very 80s, and I think the title is perfect. It sounds like a guitar shop. It sounds like a bunch of machines and mechanical stuff and a factory and like almost like the music was written as an obstacle course of machinery and Jeff Beck listened to the obstacle course and then was like, okay, this is how my guitar is going to maneuver through all of these different parts. It feels like, and this is my problem with a number of Jeff Beck albums. Like there is this real stark disconnect between what he is playing and what the rest of the band is playing. Not that they don't match. It's not a Xenocrity thing where like Jeff Beck played a solo and then laid it on top of the other part with, without any regards to what it sounded like. But almost like the other music was written and then Beck is like, okay, how am I going to maneuver through these changes and what am I going to do in the solo spot and how much space do they give me? And it, there's a real inorganic feeling. This one just feels processed to me. It feels mechanical. It feels robotic. Um, I read a review that referred to this as power rock, which if this is what power rock is, I don't like power rock. Um, I don't think Basio comes across very well. It's a couple things where Basio has like these spoken word type things where he's doing almost like this Laurie Anderson, David Byrne type spoken word thing. I don't think it works. Yeah, I just... Did not like this album at all. Um, I think I said there was only one I would probably never revisit. There's two. I don't think I'm ever going to go back and listen to this one again. <clears throat> I just couldn't get into it. Just, it did. It left me feeling cold. It left me feeling lifeless. Um, yeah. Um, if there are two types of music I don't ever like listening to, for the most part, as a general rule, obviously exceptions to every rule. Not a fan of bluegrass and not a fan of jazz fusion slash instrumental albums built around a guitar player, like Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, Joe Bonamosa, is, is he like, he's that, right? I think so, I don't know. Um, I think I listened to one of his albums and didn't like it. There's something artificial about like guitar solo vehicles. Zappa was able to pull it off because he would have one or two sort of instrumentals built around a guitar and the rest were literally just solos. He just got a solo. And because those were in the context of a song, they felt more organic. Don't like this kind of stuff. We're still got a little bit of the little bit of the jazz fusion, but we're definitely leaning in more of a heavier, harder power rock mode that does not do it for me. My number 14, Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop. Probably can fix my guitar really well. Can play the heck out of it. I just don't like the way it sounds when he does. Yeah, on to 13. Number 13 is Jeff. Um, this came out in 2003. Um, this is another one that just kind of like feels a little overproduced, feels like there's just way too much production getting in the way of really good playing. Um, I think this is another one that kind of is in the same vein as Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop, just a little bit too power rocky, whatever that means, a little bit too just, you know, leaning in on those instrumentals that just kind of don't resonate to me that have this weird power rock, weird, awkward funk, and just mechan me mechanical sound. Back again, he sounds fantastic. His guitar playing is always good. Like I have no complaints about his guitar playing ever. It's just the songs he puts around him, the music that surrounds the guitar playing just doesn't do it for me. Um, and again, I'm looking at the set list for this and like none of these albums I remember standing out. Like I've listened to this album, I think I listened to this album three times and I still, I don't think anything, you know, jumped out of me. It just felt, uh, there are moments in here. One of the great things that Beck did as we get later on this list is he started to, he discovered techno music and electronica music. Awesome, awesome stuff. There's a little bit of that in here, but not enough. This is one of those in which he's kind of, watered down the electronic stuff after doing it after a couple albums. Um, maybe trying to mix in a little more sort of his traditional type rock kind of other stylings. Um, and it just, it doesn't work for me. It, it just, there's nothing about this I thought was memorable. Um, I do remember listening to it and going, I, I would rather listen to this than Flash or uh, his Guitar Shop album. But 
it definitely was not as memorable as almost everything else that's on this list other than the next one. Um, but everything else on this list, I think had really, really solid moments that I could be like, I, this song was good. This song was good. This one, I don't know. This one just kind of left me a little bit, a uh, little bit feeling a little cold, not my type of music. Um, but yeah, that would be what? Number 13, um, Jeff. Sorry, Jeff. It's your name, but didn't like your album. On to number 12. Number 12 is uh, his 1973 collaboration with Bogert and a piece, Beck Bogert a piece, both of Vanilla Fudge and of the fantastic group Cactus, um, which I love, which Beck was supposed to be a part of, but apparently got in an accident, so he wasn't. The guitar player that they got to replace him in Cactus is ridiculously underrated, and you need to know about him. You'll learn about him more next week if you want to stick around for that video. Um, but this is an album I sought out. I had heard this album before this, um, and I sought it out because Bogart and A Piece are in Cactus. They're also in Vanilla Fudge. Um, love those Cactus albums. I was hoping this had that same sort of energy. Doesn't. Um, just kind of disappointed in this album. It's got some good moments. Um, the opening Black Cat Moan, I think, is pretty good. The cover of Superstition is pretty funky. Um, Stevie Wonder Superstition came out of a jam session between Beck and Stevie Wonder. Apparently, Beck came up with that drum intro on Superstition, and Stevie Wonder heard it and was like, dude, play that. And then Stevie was like improvising. He's just like, bum, 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 you know, just improvised the whole song and apparently made it up while Beck just like played that drum intro. Um, so they, uh, and Stevie Wonder agreed that he could release this song first, but due to like, contract label type stuff. Stevie Wonders came out first and this followed, but this was supposed to come out first. Undi the highlight of this album by far, but everything else, I don't know. It just, it's, it's kind of boring, very bland, bad, just kind of, you know, your typical sort of early seventies blues rock type stuff. Um, the type of stuff that Cactus would do on other albums, much, much, much better than this. Highly recommend you check out their first two albums or wait next week. because I'm going to make a video about them because I love that group. Um, but anyways, yeah, just this doesn't do it for me. It was more disappointing. I, I thought this would be a better album than it was. Um, but yeah, something about it just leaves me feeling empty. Again, it's like even Beck, I don't think, is at his best on this album. The whole thing just feels like, yeah, it just feels like uh, kind of forgettable, which is sad because this should have been more epic. But yeah, but the rest of these on this list, the rest of these on this list all have some pretty good moments on to number 11. Number 11 is 2010's Emotion and Commotion, which, I, did you see that album cover? Might be one of the worst album covers I've ever seen. Um, this one is the his follow-up to Jeff. There was seven years between that. I'm not sure what he did between those times. I'm sure he did something. Um, this one I like because it, it leans a little more into his slower stuff. Uh, the title is pretty good. It seems like every song is either Emotion more of a melodic, I don't want to say soulful because I don't think that's ever a right word for Beck's playing, but maybe a little more melodic, melodic, slightly emotional, just a little more evocative as far as your feelings go type songs versus commotion versus you're more like, you know, <clears throat> his his standard uh, new millennium type, a little bit of techno, a little bit of rock, a little bit of that power rock atmosphere coming in there. Um, I think there's strings on here. Um, there's a, a pretty good cover of I Put a Spell on You. There's a cover of Over the Rainbow, which I don't need to hear ever. I'm, I'm sorry, Judy Garland did that perfect once. No one else ever needs to sing Over the Rainbow or do an instrumental version of it. That includes you, Flaming Lips. Um, there's a couple really, really good songs on here that I like. Joss Stone sings on it. Um, and Mount of May has a little part that she sings on. Um, it's just kind of a neat little all over the map type album. Um, in which we get a lot of different vibes from him and a lot of different emotions, but not in a way that feels overwhelming or not in a way that feels like he's trying too hard to be too many things. It it, it kind of sounds fun at times. Even the slower pieces, there's sort of just a straightforward simplicity to them where like Beck's like, I know what I'm doing at this point in my career. I'm just going to go out and make some, some pretty good music. Um, yeah, and I don't think... I mean, it's not a great album. Um, I think there are songs that are just a little too much guitar solo vehicle for me. Um, 
but it's a really consistent listen. <clears throat> and I really like it. I like the flow of the album. I like sort of the contrast in the songs. And really the only thing on here that I think is just 100% completely unnecessary is his Over the Rainbow. And every time I hear it, which has been three times now, I'm like, ah, remember when Judy Garland actually sang this part, how good that was? I want to hear those vocals. But anyways, yeah, pretty good album. Like, um, you know, for somebody, this is, came out in 2010, but this is like 40... 45 years-ish into his career and he's still making an album that sounds this kind of fresh and alive and exciting and like somebody who cares. It's pretty good stuff, man. That's surprising. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that it's 11 because I do think the top 10 are just all that much better. And now we're getting to what I think might be the very first, no, number nine, I think is maybe the first hot take on here. Uh, but yeah, let's let's get on to number 10. Number <clears throat> 10 is, 2000, is 1980s, <clears throat> There and Back. This was the first album he released after Wired. Uh, Blow, by, Blow by Blow and Wired were sort of his jazz fusion, highly critically acclaimed albums of the mid-70s. This is pretty much the third of that trio. Pretty much the same vibe, very jazz fusion-y. Jan Hammer is the keyboardist on here, which I'm not a big Jan Hammer fan. Not a big fan of the sounds he chooses. Not a big fan of just his overall vibe that he has. A little too jazz fusion-y for me. Um, but this is a pretty good album. Like, it's one of those where while I'm listening to it, other than the Jan Homerisms that pop up kind of frequently, I think he wrote a couple songs on here. I enjoy the songs. Um, I don't think any of them are that bad or that annoying. I just don't think they're as memorable as Blow by Blow and Wired, his other two sort of jazz fusion albums. Um, one of the songs, El Beco, I really, really like. There's just a really good fun vibe about that. Space Boogie, the penultimate track, has some really nice energy about it. Um, it's just got some really good moments on this album that I think really work well. And I think there are some really nice spots where his guitar playing shines in a way that feels a little more organic, a little more natural than some of his other songs. Um, yeah, it's just, it feels really, it feels, it's a comfortable album. Again, it's not, it's not too adventurous. It's pretty safe. He's pretty much mining the same territory that he mined with Blow by Blow and Wired. And I think if you really like Blow by Blow and Wired, like, I don't know why you wouldn't like this one. Like, I think you would rank them either Wired or Blow by Blow first, and this would obviously be the third. I don't think the, the songs themselves um, are anywhere near as good as on those other two albums. Um, but I do think it's an enjoyable album. And I do think there's a big step between the quality of this and the one that's number uh, 11 with uh, Emotion and Commotion. Um, so yeah, a pretty good way to enter the 80s. He would take five years off after this, or at least five years as far as making solo albums, and then he would come back with the abysmal flash. But this was a pretty good pretty good end of the 70s and start to the 80s. Um, so yeah, that would be my, my number 10, um, Jeff Beck's There and Back. Number nine, and this is probably the first real hot take on here I'm imagining, is Wired. Uh, his 19, somebody's honking, his 1976 jazz fusion album. Um, this is another one that has Jan Hammer on it. But Max Middleton, which was in his second incarnation of the Jeff Beck group, is still on here, who I really like. I like piano, um, other keyboards. Um, but yeah, this is, like, again, I'm not a big fan of jazz fusion. This is like, he's fully in the jazz fusion phase. Um, couple excellent songs on here. His cover of Mingus's Goodbye Pork by Hat is pretty exquisite. However, it does make me want to go listen to some Mingus. So it's good in evoking that. But at the same time, if I'm, if I'm yearning for the, the original, your cover maybe hasn't succeeded as well as you think it has, but I think it is the highlight of this album. Um, the opening track, Lead Boots, Lead is spelled L-E-D because supposedly it's inspired by Led Zeppelin. Uh, yeah, maybe, I guess. The drum beat, I don't know. Doesn't sound Led zeppelin -y to me. There's, there's lacking a certain rawness to it. Um, again, my problem with this album is not Jeff Beck's guitar playing. He's a fantastic guitar player. I just don't think the songs that surround his guitar playing, I don't think the sound of the songs, the sound of the bass, the sound of the keyboards, that very sterile mid-70s studio musician sort of L.A. I don't know if it was 
recorded in LA or where it was recorded, but there is a certain sound that LA albums, I'm sure this is probably London because he's English, right? Um, but there's a certain sound that those 70s, oh, it was in LA and Hollywood, um, that sound that they have, just a pristine, clean, completely lacking edging, highly polished, that just doesn't work for me. Give me some edge. Give me a little bit of aggression. Give me a little bit of energy. That's not on here. That's missing. Um, that's why this is ranked at number nine, an album that I think is generally regarded as one of his best. It does not do it for me. I understand why people like it. I see the attraction to this album. If this is your kind of thing, it's not my kind of thing. Um, and I do think it's it's one of those albums I can respect, but I'm going to respect from a distance and maybe not listen to it all that much. Um, but yeah, but really that cover of Goodbye Pork by Hat, excellent choice in covers. Good job on this one. You done well on this one, Jeff. Uh, but the rest of the album kind of just doesn't do all that much for me. That's number nine, Wired. Number eight is his last solo album, other than that one he did with Johnny Depp, which I'm not going to talk about because I refuse to listen to out of general principles. Um, that is Loud Hailer. And this, I like this album. Um, he's got like a, a singer on here, uh, Rosie Bones, who does some vocals. Um, there's another guitar player, Carmen Vandenberg, who's getting in on the action. Um, it's got a lot of the techno energy and electronic energy from his other stuff. It's got a couple kind of good songs. It's got some sort of soulful female singer energy. Um, it's just kind of mixing it up a little bit. And it feels, in a way, it feels like what, this came out in 2016, like maybe he's like, I don't know, a decade behind the times musically and that had this come out maybe earlier or to be a little more cutting edge. But at the same time, he's still going new directions. He's still experimenting. He's still mixing things up. It's kind of a fun album. It's got some really good songs on it. Um, the Re Revolution Will Be Televised is the opening song again. Um, maybe not a fresh idea in 2016. I mean, uh, I come from the slam poetry world and people were slamming the revolution will be televised in the late nineties, you know, so that's not a new idea. Uh, but I like the energy. Um, I like a lot of these songs on here, that thugs club scared for the children. Um, things that I remember list popping out of me when I was listening to them. It's just got some good energy. Um, I don't think anybody in the band is, you know, there's no Bozio, there's no Kaliuta, there's no like real epic musicians, Jan Hammer on here. It's just a really good, solid kind of funky, kind of fun album. Um, and it really surprised me. Like when I was listening to these, you know, I, the ones that preceded this were Jeff and Emotion and Commotion, you know, so I was expecting this to even be farther down the list and just like, no, this is kind of, there's a new energy to this. There's like, uh, you know, it made me want to go listen to that Depp album, but then the Depp album is mostly covers and a couple Johnny Depp songs, so I refused to do that. Uh, general jo Anti-Johnny Depp, general principles. Um, but anyways, yeah, I highly recommend this. Like, and I, I did, as I do, I make my list and then I go through Google and see what other people think of these albums just so I can prepare myself for whatever comments I may get based on the general world. And I saw this at the end of people's list and I saw this on the front of people's list on both sides. So I like the fact that he's able to make music that can be like both embraced by people looking for something new and sort of like, no, this isn't the Jeff Beck we love, but he was able to do that. And it, it, it's, it's an exciting album. Like, I don't know. I, I thought this was just like, I don't know. This album made me sad I hadn't got into Jeff Beck earlier. Um, I had a chance to see Jeff Beck once. He played at Bonnaroo and I had every intention on going to his show. Um, but I think he was at the same time as Dead Weather or maybe he was like a half hour before the Dead Weather. And I realized I had scored a perfect spot in like the pit at the big Dead Weather stage. So I was like, yeah, I'm not leaving this spot. This is too good. Um, so then I, I skipped Jeff back. So I never saw him live. Um, but, and this obviously came out after that. I think it was like 2010, 2009 when he was at Bonnaroo. Um, but anyways, yeah. Anyways, this is a good album. I really, really enjoyed this album. His final album, 2016's Loud Hailer. Number seven, what number is this, seven? Number seven is his debut album, 1968's Truth. Uh, this was the one that, um, one I had heard before. I thought this was like a Faces or Small Faces album. I realized that my roommate 
one of my roommates in college. I think it was uh, the guy who was a big Who fan. You know who you are if you're watching this. Um, uh, I think he had played this a couple times because I was listening to this going, I know these songs. I know this. I know this version of this song that I don't like. And I know what. So I think I'd heard this back in college. So that had been decades ago. Um, Rod Stewart's on vocals immediately for the win. Uh, Ronnie Woods on bass immediately for the win. Um, Mickey Waller's on drums. Um, my problem with this album, and this is one of those I saw like on the top of a lot of people's lists. It's sort of like the birth of heavy metal and all these other sort of completely like all-time great acclamation, acclamations, uh, acclamations, that doesn't sound like a word, proclamations about this band, uh, about this album. I don't know, it just didn't do it for me. And I, I'll tell you why. It's the covers, people. I, I just can't get behind most of the covers. And it's not Jeff Beck's fault that other people did these covers <clears throat> much better than he did. Opens up with Shapes of Things, excellent version, sort of a rewriting of this song. Works great, great opener. Let Me Love You, pretty good second song. Then we get a cover of Morning Dew. Doesn't compare to the Dads, but nothing compares to the Dads. Doesn't compare to the Allman Brothers early version um, when they were what, that other band that they were. Doesn't compare to the original. That eerie sort of like everybody's dead and now we're trying to make life better without kind of acknowledging that they're dead and maybe that eeriness is just completely lacking. And I don't even think Stewart does a very good job delivering the vocals on this. You Shook Me is the next song. Sorry, buddy, but Led Zeppelin did this and nobody can do You Shook Me after Led Zeppelin touches this. It just doesn't compare. Old Man River, uh, uh. Um, Green Sleeves, I don't want to hear Green Sleeves. Maybe if it opens and or closes the album, but it opens side two and I just, no, I don't. Uh, Rock My Plim Soul is good. Uh, Blues Deluxe, uh, the penultimate song is a nice little jammy number in there that is actually one of the highlights of the album. Um, a cover of Willie Dixon's I Ain't Superstitious is really good. But the biggest problem I have with this is with Bex Bolero. I understand this is like generally regarded as a great song, but to me, it seems like half a song. Every time I hear this song, it sounds like it's sort of the second half of Layla, that there should have been a two and a half, three minute upbeat rocker that ends in sort of fades or segues or morphs into Bex Bolero. Bex Bolero seems like half of a fantastic idea. I just want the other half. Maybe if it had gone on for another three minutes, it's only two and a, it's like three minutes, just under three minutes. It just feels like I want more. It feels incomplete. There's good ideas in here. I like the overall concept. Um, you know, there are things that work, but it just kind of feels, it leaves me feeling like I want more. There needs to be something more to this. Um, and, and for that, it just, this album always just kind of kind of disappoints me. Just an unfortunate selection of covers, um, and then a couple songs which I think people, which I just don't think are as great as people think. Rod Stewart, thank you. He raises his higher. Ron Wood's bass playing raises it higher. Um, but yeah, for the most part, this this album I'm underwhelmed by it. You know, maybe if I'd heard it in '68 when it came out, you know, I was I wasn't even born. I wasn't even wasn't even like. You know, yeah, I'm not even going to say where I was in 68. I was still in the Navy in my dad at that point. But yeah, this album, I, I see why. I, I see the attraction of it. Rod Stewart makes it good. There are some good songs and some good playing. But ultimately, I think it's just, it's a little disappointing. Just leaves me feeling, wanting a little bit more. Um, and, and we will get that more on the next album. But that next album, it's not coming for a while. But let's get on to number six. Number six is 1975's, right? Uh, Blow by Blow. The first of his three sort of jazz fusion instrumental albums. This one is really good. I think this one is much better than Wired. Um, the, the, the choice of cover songs are better. Uh, there's a couple Stevie Wonder collaborations, which are simply fantastic. Um, I think the playing is, feels a little more organic and it feels more like a band actually playing instead of a band writing music that Jeff Beck has to like do tricks through on his guitar. Um, yeah, it just feels better. Um, opens up with, you know what I mean? A pretty good upbeat little number, a cover of the Beatles, She's a Woman, uh, which is a really good choice of covers. And I think it just kind of works. 
constipated duck, not a big fan of that. Air blower, scatterbrain, awesome ending to the first side, a really good sort of kind of funky little number. Um, but then side, side two is almost perfect. I mean, it really is a fantastic side of music, even the fact that it does have a jazz fusion-y. Um, Stevie Wonder's Cause We've Ended as Lovers, which is just Jeff Beck as, at his emotive best. Maybe the closest he gets to being soulful that I still think that's a weird word to use for back. Soulful is not a word I would use for him. Um, but he's he's evoking some emotion in here. Like it, it's there's this is a well written song and and he's doing he's doing Stevie Wonder justice. Um, second song on the side is called Thelonious, another Stevie Wonder song which is fantastic. And then the absolutely epic Freeway Jam, which is just. Uh, this one I knew. It was all over the radio. This was the reason I bought this album. KMET in LA played this song all the time. Love this song. And then it closes out with the nice eight-minute Diamond Dust, which is just a nice, nice kind of cool, sweet, sultry way to close out the album that feels just, just really good. Yeah, this is a really good album. Um, again, there are times... I have to be in the right mood to listen to it because of its sort of jazz, fusion, pristine, clean quality. Uh, but the songs surrounding the plane are so much better than I think almost all the songs on all the albums earlier on this list that it elevates this. Like the difference between this and truth is another step up to like higher quality. And we're getting closer to that like truly epic back album. But even this I think is... I think you got to have a particular like of a certain type of music to really get into this jazz fusion stuff. I think the cleanliness of it turns a lot of people off because it does have that, 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 that vibe that, you know, even I can't get around to a lot of the time, but this is a good album. Yeah, man. Like if you have not gone into back starting with what, uh, what is this blow by blow? You would not do yourself wrong by starting with blow by blow, because if you like blow by blow, you're in a lock, you're in luck people. You're going to have a lot of good music. You're going to like, but yeah, that is what, my number six? That is my number six. On to number five. Number five is 1999's Who Else? Who Else? Not a question, it's an exclamation. Who Else? Um, I really like this album. This is his first foray into electronica, into techno. He is embracing this. His guitar playing style works incredibly well in sort of the, the machine artificiality of techno music. Um, it's almost the same problem as like jazz fusion. Like, again, it seems like there's a, a backing track that exists that he's inserting his guitar playing in. Same with this. There's this techno track that he's inserting his guitar playing this, but he's leaning in on those pedals and he's making noises. And there are times you can't tell if it's a guitar or it's a synthesizer, or it's a drum machine, and it just sounds fantastic. Um, and there are times I'm listening to this, I'm like, what is this? Why? Oh, it's a Jeff Beck album. That's right. That's how techno heavy this is. If you don't like techno, stay away from this. If you like a little bit of electronica and techno in your, in your music, this is fantastic. And the best thing about it, first three songs, perfect example of what works in this album and even some of these other later albums, is What Mama Said, heavy on the techno. Uh, Psycho Sam, heavy on the techno. Then we segue into a live blues song called Brush With The Blues. Uh, it's live, though the, the sound is excellent. You can just hear a little smattering of applause in the background. But it's this slow blues number that is just emotional and slowly builds and it's Jeff Beck doing that sort of because we've ended his lovers thing and it works fantastic and from there on out the album is a little bit of like techno heavy softness techno softness hypnotica is kind of hypnotic in a weird like cool back techno beats that are almost like like a if Khan was a techno band in the background that he's playing over. There's just a lot of really neat sort of contrast and relief on this album. And the techno stuff is fantastic. Again, we have a whole bunch of different musicians on here. Like Manu Katche is on here. Jan Hammer returns. Hymas is around from uh, the Jeff Beck Guitar Shop. Jennifer Batten is playing guitar. Like a lot of really good musicians, but... It doesn't ever, it feels cluttered in the way techno feels cluttered, but that works for me. It's really good. Um, 
yeah, this was, I think, the most surprising thing on here. Getting to this, I think this was what came out in 1989. And I think the two albums, like he had, this was the first album he had done after Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop that wasn't a collaboration or working with other people. He had taken a break from doing his own albums. And he, I thought this was just going to be like, li listening to this after that Jeff Beck Guitar Shop, knowing there's like 10 years between this. I didn't expect much out of this. This blew me away with how good it was. I'm going to, I'm going to re-listen to this one a lot. I've already have. I think I've listened to this more than my three times. Um, yeah, really good album. But if you if you don't like techno music, stay the heck away from this thing. That's my number five, right? My number five? Yeah, my number five. Who else? On to the next one. Number four is the Jeff Beck Group, the second version of the Jeff Beck Group's second album, the Jeff Beck Group or Jeff Brett group. Um, this is Bobby Tenge on vocals. He replaced Rod Stewart uh, on the previous album. Max Middleton, who would be around for a while on keyboards, and Cozy Powell on drums, plus Clive Chaman on bass guitar. And it's a band. It sounds like a band. They're playing blues rock. There's nothing special about the blues rock. It's nothing cutting edge. It's just a band playing really, really good blues rock music. And who's their guitar player? It's Jeff Beck. So when there's a solo or when there's a guitar part, you can't go wrong. Bass player sounds pretty good. Max Middleton's uh, both piano, sort of an electric organ sound. He had some jazz flavorings that kind of show the, the, the sort of jazz fusion that Beck would go to after this. I think they work well. There are songs on here that are driven by the piano, so it does feel like a band collective effort. Um, just a lot of really good songs. Opening Ice Cream Cakes is a great opener. There's a cover of uh, um, Bob Dylan's Tonight I'll Be Staying Here With You that works perfectly. Um, just, yeah, we got a, a Stevie Wonder song, I Gotta Have a Song. Like all of these songs, they're just, yeah, they're just, they're a band playing really good rock music, blues rock music. And I think that is the thing that the album's, on this list that didn't make it this high have as a problem is they don't feel like they're a collective group of musicians. It feels like a bunch of musicians creating music so Jeff Beck has a vehicle over which to solo. This sounds like Jeff Beck is a member of the band, happens to be the most talented member of the band, but he's a member of the band putting out some good music. Is this one of the best blues rock albums ever made? Nah, not even close. That, again, is the problem I have with Jeff Beck. He didn't make that perfect, iconic album. But this is a really good listen. Good covers, good playing. I, I think the vocalist is good. The musicians are good. Cozy Powell's on drums. So, yeah, man, really good album. Um, this is one I, that will I will see staying in my rotation after this because I'm glad I discovered this. I had not heard this before. Oh, the ones I had heard before, because I don't think I mentioned it, I knew Flash, I knew Wired, I knew Blow by Blow. Wired and Blow by Blow are the ones that I'm hit and miss on. Um, I knew Beck, Bogart, and a piece. I talk about that. The other one that I listened to that I own, I haven't got to yet, um, but we'll get to that uh, in a couple more. But anyways, that's my number four, Jeff Beck Group, his fourth album, his second of the Jeff Beck Group's second incarnation. Yeah, on to number three. Number three is Rough and Ready, the first album of the second Jeff Beck Group's incarnation. Bobby Tench, Max Middleton, Clive Chaman, Cozy Powell. Um, pretty much the same vibe as that one I just talked about. Some really good blues rock. I think just better playing. Um, less songs. So a couple of the songs you really get to stretch out more and you have more of a, a jammy, like that mid early 70s, just a blues rock band jamming and stretching out type feel. I think Max Middleton gets a little more time to shine on this. Um, yeah, I think Beck wrote all but one of the songs. Uh, Max Middleton wrote the other. Max's tune is the one that Max wrote. Um, and again, I just think it's a really good album. I think there's really good songs on here. I think the playing is really good. Um, there's some just excellent vibe. Uh, the band is good. It's, it's again, it's a really A, may, maybe an A, not definitely not an S tier, but maybe an A, probably not an A plus, but an A tier, early 70s blues rock album with one of the most underrated, underappreciated guitar players ever as the guitar player. Um, but yeah, seven songs. What is it? Like 36 minutes? Yeah, it's like 36 minutes long. You know, they're not aiming. I think they're not trying to hit a home run. They're just like, you know, they're playing their game. They're doing their thing. It's some really good music. Um, 
And yeah, I really, really enjoyed this album a lot. And it's kind of the meat and potatoes that I want more out of from more of from Jeff Beck. Just a really good meat and potatoes early 70s blues rock album. Really enjoyed this. Um, my number three, uh, his third album, Rough and Ready. Number two is 2000's You Had It Coming. Give me more techno. Give me more electronica. Give me more of that industrial kind of sound that you're leaning into. I love this album. Um, again, a lot of Jeff Beck originals, not that many covers. I think the only cover on here is uh, Rolling and Tumbling, Muddy Waters. It's a great cover. We got a couple songs with a little bit of vocals on it. Um, it just, I don't know, man. It just is a fun, upbeat, kind of like, again, you know, it's what, 2000? So we're, we're leaning into the techno in 2000. That's not that bad. That's a, a, about right time. He's not too behind the times. Um, yeah, it, again, it just, there's an artificiality about it because it's techno, but this works. Because I think all of his, like, you know, his pedal board, I guarantee you over the course of this, what, 40 minutes, 35 minutes, he probably used every single pedal and effect he had at some point to create all the ridiculous noises and all the different solos and all the different sounds that he creates on this album. It is a fun, fun album. Uh, uh, drums and bass, Steve Alexander, Randy Hope Taylor, don't really, don't know if I know them. Jennifer Button's on guitar again. Um, yeah, man. This is just, again, a mostly instrumental album other than the two tracks that have kind of like spoken word little parts. I think Rumbling and Tumbling has vocals with Imogene Heap. Imogene Heap? Imogen Heap? Don't know how to say her name. Um, yeah, really good, man. Really, really good album. Absolutely blew me away when I got to this. Uh, and this was the one that followed Who Else? So that pairing of back-to-back -back albums in 99 and 2000, this guy hit it out of the ballpark with this. I really wish I had discovered this at that time because... Had he been touring on this stuff or had he been playing live stuff on this, it had to have been fantastic. I don't know how it wouldn't have been. But anyways, this album just blew me away with how good it was. Um, yeah, but that's my number two. You had it coming. Now, we're on to number one, an album I've owned forever that I've listened to more than any other. And maybe that's why it's number one, but I actually still think it's his best. Let's get on to it. And number one is Beck Ola, his second album, the first one with the Jeff Beck group, even though it's pretty much the same group that was on the first album with one incredible addition. So you get Rod Stewart on vocals, you got Ronnie Wood on bass, ridiculous, Tony Newman on drums, and Nicky Hopkins on piano and organ. And man, is his are his contributions fantastic. Um, just, just a great album. Just, again, it's a Rod, Rod Stewart. It, this could be a Rod Stewart album. This could be a Jeff Beck album. This could be, it is just a really good, like, what is it? Do what I say it was, 69? Late 60s blues rock album that you would expect from somebody like Jeff Beck and Rod Stewart when they're getting together. Um, just, again, seven songs, a couple songs we get a little chance to stretch out. Um, we get some beautiful instrumental Girl from the Mill Valley, which uh, from Mill Valley, which Nick Hopkins wrote. We get a cover of Jailhouse Rock, which should not work, but for some reason does. The opening all shook up is fantastic. Rod Stewart's on vocals. What more could you ask for? Spanish Boots. Side two is just a couple incredible songs with this nice long jammy number called Rice Pudding. Um, again, really short album, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, 30 minutes long. There is not a wasted moment on here. It is just blues rock, early hard rock. I've heard people name drop heavy metal in reading reviews. Uh, yeah, it's a stretch. But yeah, like this is this is the closest thing I would use to say like, why is Beck one of the greatest guitar players of all time? This is the album I would I would refer to. Only 30 minutes. But for me, this is so much more exciting, so much vital, so much sort of like alive than like wired or blow by blow, those other things which are generally regarded as iconic. I think th the lack, the choice of covers on here, even with Jailhouse Rock being better than him, it's a better choice than on his previous album, Truth, mainly because other bands didn't then outdo those covers and make his look kind of pale, pale in comparison. But man, this is just an absolutely fantastic one. This album is so good. Um, that, yeah, this is the one, I don't know how to say it. Again, 
This album and Truth are so good because of Rod Stewart that I've gone recently down a Rod Stewart rabbit hole again. Um, and I was going to make a Rod Stewart video, but then I realized the last Stewart album I know, I think is his like 80 album, 80 or 81. I've not listened to a single Stewart album after that and looking at them, I'm like, I really don't want to, but I really like Stewart's 70 work as cheesy as it is. Blondes Have More Fun is such a stupidly fantastic album, as cheesy as that is. But anyways... I'm getting on a sidetrack. It's a really good album, man. And if anything, Jeff Beck and Rod Stewart, I wish they had stayed together because I think that is a pairing. Stewart's voice is fantastic. Man, had this band stayed together, I don't know. I, I wish they hadn't broken up. This is a band that I think, I think if this band had made one or two more albums, Beck would have that Layla and, and other assorted love songs. He would have that moment where everybody could say, that album is a must hear. Being that they only made two, and this is the second one, this is the album, I would argue, is his must hear. Again, none of these songs are as iconic as songs on other albums from other guitar players. Again, that is Steve, uh, that is Jeff Beck ultimately failing. But I still think this is a really good album. Yeah, that's my number one. His second one, Bacola. And that's all I got, people. I've been listening to nine of these albums for about two weeks now, and those are my thoughts on them. So again... I, it hasn't changed my opinion much of Beck. I've discovered some new stuff that I absolutely love. I think I have way more respect for him as a guitar player. Um, he is an absolutely fantastic guitar player. He pretty much can do anything. I understand why other musicians love him so much. Um, and I do think if there's one failing, he just doesn't have that one album that is truly like an S tier, perfect, all like 10 out of 10 album. I think that's just, he wasn't fortunate enough to be a good enough songwriter himself or to have other people providing him the songs. That would be my complaint. Let me know why I'm wrong. If any Jeff Beck lovers have made it this far in this video or watch this, please fill me in. I want to learn. That's why I'm here. But this has been fun. I like this. A couple of these albums I'm going to revisit a lot. In fact, I think I'm going to go back and listen to uh, um, You Had It Coming Right Now because I, I, I'm excited about that. But that's it. Comment, subscribe, like. You know how it works. Talk to you later. Peace.